Hello, baby. Welcome to the Smart People Podcast. Sit back, grab a drink, tune in your brain. Ask not what your country can do for you. This nation will rise up. Welcome to Smart People Podcast, the smartest podcast I have ever done. My name is Chris Stemp. And I'm John Rojas. You can blame it on me that we're a few days late for releasing this, uh, this episode, but I was recently in San Francisco for SF Sketch Fest. I was out of town, unable to do the podcast, so we're a few days late here, but I promise we'll, we'll release some episodes quickly and get you guys caught right back up. So we have reached our 10th episode, not that that's a great accomplishment, but along the way we've changed a lot from if you listen to the first one until now, we've kind of done away with the echo as one of our listeners commented, thank you for closing the garage door. So we're trying to get better, the podcast is continually evolving, and we're really doing that through your comments. Uh, You guys have stepped up your contacts, which you can do at contact us at our webpage, www.smartpeoplepodcast.com. You can tell us who you want to hear. Do you want to be on the listener segment, which we're still doing? You guys are helping us out a lot by using our Amazon widget. If you go to the bottom left-hand corner of the page and just click on Amazon, it brings you to the Amazon site. Anything you order gives us a little kickback, but it's free to you. So it's our way of taking money from the man. Thanks again for all your help there. The Twitter name is Smart People Pod. You can go on there, see when the episodes are being released. You know, Shoot us some comments on there as well. Here's a question for all you out there and the guy across the table. Have you ever thought about writing a book? I actually have. Of course you have. The whole world has. What do you want to write a book on? You don't know. You just think one day you want to write a book. That's right. Okay. Most people are probably like my trusted friend here, Mr. Rojas. I have. Everybody has. You think what you have to say is worthwhile. It's probably not. But say it is. Today on the podcast, we are going to interview a guy who can help you write this book. And believe me, this isn't just some, oh, I've written a book. This guy, his name is Stanley Fish, and he got his undergrad from University of Pennsylvania, his Ph.D. from Yale. He has written over 12 books. He is the Davidson Kahn Distinguished University Professor of Humanities at Florida International University. He's also taught at Illinois, Columbia, Johns Hopkins, Berkeley, Duke, and he's a frequent contributor to the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. He is an American literary theorist, so he gets into actually breaking down writings and how to do it. And his most recent book is called How to Write a Sentence and How to Read One. We thought it was kind of interesting given that we interview authors all the time. How does that book come together? Yeah. Now, as I mentioned, I've thought about writing a book, but one of the reasons why I haven't gotten into it is I found that writing papers and essays at school to sort of be a struggle for me. You know, just that introductory sentence and that closing sentence. I would sit there for hours trying to figure out how am I going to draw my listeners in and how am I going to tie this all up together? So I think I could write a book that would be you know, pretty interesting if people just opened it up and started on page like 25. Well, if that's not a lead in, I don't know what is because we actually ask him the question, how do you formulate an introductory sentence and a concluding sentence? Things like that that'll help you if you want to be a writer, if you like reading, if you're a student, if your kid's a student, uh, this is a great book to pass along to them. We are now going to let you listen to Stanley Fish. We'll catch you back in about 20 minutes. We did the research and everything. When we found you, we read your books. You're an extremely distinguished author and professor. What prompted you to go into the literary arena and to kind of continue on the the path that you've gone on, you know, within writing and teaching? Well, what prompted me to write this particular book was a graduate student course when my students were producing papers that were ungrammatical and barely readable. 
Um, and I then discovered that those same graduate students were teaching freshman composition courses. And I investigated the situation and discovered that in many courses in my own college, I was then the dean of the college, writing was not being taught. Rather, what was being taught uh, uh, were interesting sets of essays uh, on hot-button topics uh, like racism or, or gay marriage or gun control. And so I decided that this had to be reformed, but I also decided that before I did anything, I should uh, once again return to the composition classroom and teach a class myself. And so that's what I did. And I began to develop the ideas uh, that are now uh, in that book in that way. And I found that much of the teaching of composition had been unfortunately politicized by a weak kind of multiculturalism which seemed to take over the entire course and leave no room for the teaching of the craft of writing. Could you go into that last point you made just about how you, d you disagree with the way it's being taught in, in class? Well, a lot, in a lot of composition courses, two things happen. First of all, the course is built around a series of ideas as presented in essays written by well-known people. Now, those essays are often really very good essays, but that's part of the problem. Because once a student becomes interested in ideas in the content of the essays, that interest will take over from the interest in learning how to craft sentences. So one of my first rules is never have any ideas in a composition course, and especially don't have any ideas that an instructor might be interested in, because then you've lost the game before you begin if the point of the game is to teach students how to write. I also found that in many composition course courses, instructors felt that what they were supposed to do was train their students for a certain kind of ideological warfare, usually on the left. They wanted their students to come out having the appropriate and correct views. And I think that both of those things, the concentration on essays and the insistence on some instructors that the, what they were teaching was ideology and politics, got in the way and has gotten in the way of the teaching of writing. Okay. And, of course, the, the book that you speak of is your newest book that just came out, How to Write a Sentence and How to Read a Sentence, which I found, okay. I found very incredible, specifically because, and I mentioned this in my email to you, almost everyone I come across at some point has considered writing a book. Everybody thinks they're going to be an author. And I kind of wanted to right, get right. Your, your point of view on um, your advice to them and also what you think about that. Being an author is not an easy thing to do, and you can see why when you think about how hard it is for many people even to write a sentence. It's odd, really, because the people who have difficulty in writing a sentence are often people who have no difficulty in saying a sentence, speaking in conversation to their friends. But once the assignment is given to write something down, uh, anxiety takes over, and uh, uh, you can almost see people, especially students, freeze. Uh, so what I argue in this particular book is that if you want to become comfortable with the idea of writing sentences, you should practice with sentence forms, not so much with sentence content and ideas, but with the forms of sentences, uh, so that you can produce sentences of different forms and uh, even dull or nonsensical contents on demand. And the more you do this, the more uh, facile in a good sense, the more practice you become in manipulating forms without any concern for their content, the more will you be able to write something powerful when you do have a content that you want to get across. And that's why I call this in, in one section of the book the Karate Kid method of teaching writing. Because if you remember in that movie, uh, the kid doesn't learn uh, the, the, the craft of fighting by fighting. Uh, he learns the craft by doing formal exercises like waxing cars and painting fences. And it is then that after he's uh, learned that uh, and internalized the formal skills that he is ready for a match. And so my idea of the teaching of composition is form, 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 form. Content will follow when you need it. I actually wanted to ask you, if you could tell me and tell our listeners 
some advice on creating a first and last sentence because I know you talk about it in your book and I know from personal experience as a student, once I got the first sentence on paper, I could cruise through it and then I would struggle one more time with the last sentence. All right. Well, I think that your experience is the experience of many. Um, and, and the reason is that a good first sentence is written by an author who knows where the rest of his text or composition is going. And if you don't know that, it's hard, in fact, to write a first sentence. But if you have a good idea of where you want to take your reader, you can write a sentence that leans, that's L-E-A-N-S, leans in the direction uh, of the goal to which you will finally bring your reader. So it's important to write first sentences, and this will almost sound mystical, that know all about the sentences that will follow them. If you can write a first sentence that invites your reader in, and you, as you write it, know how that sentence is going to unfold or flower into a full composition, you've, in fact, gotten the head start, and as you said, things go very well after that. And how about in terms of a final sentence? Well, a final sentence is a little tricky because there are more goals that you might want to have. The goal of a first sentence is to set things up in a way that will direct both you and your reader. The goal of a final sentence uh, could be to sum up what's been said. It could be to raise new questions which you deliberately leave unanswered because you want to have a kind of open-ended texture at the end. Or it, it could be to go back to an earlier part of the book and now... Uh, redeem its promise, uh, which at the beginning was perhaps uh, vague or un, uh, not filled up. So there are many kinds of things that you can do at the end, um, and you have to choose what effect you want uh, your reader to experience. Do you want the reader to be satisfied, feel that a circle has been closed? Do you want to keep your reader thinking? Do you want to upset your reader? Uh, at the end, do you want to send your reader out marching or going to the barricades? Many, many different uh, goals that you might have in writing that last sentence. I wanted to take a step back real quick to uh, one of the answers you gave a little bit ago about the uh, professors you know, teaching their <laughs> ideas and, and values. You also wrote the book, Save the World on Your Own Time. And in That's that right. book, you mentioned that universities need to return to their job of teaching students to think rather than what to think. I wouldn't put it that way. My message was even simpler than that. Okay. My message was that professors in colleges and universities should do their jobs and not do the jobs that belong appropriately uh, to other people in other professions. That is, what is it that we as professors were trained to do? We're trained in the mastery of certain sets of materials, whether they're in economics or literature or politics or chemistry. And what we are supposed to do when we come into a class is, first of all, introduce the students to those materials. Presumably, they are unfamiliar with them or at least relatively unfamiliar with them. And the second thing we want to do is equip students with the skills that will allow them to move around in those materials easily. They may be statistical skills or analytical skills or laboratory skills or argumentative skills or interpretive skills in the case of literary courses. But those are the two things that you want to do as a teacher. Anything else, as far as I'm concerned, is out of bounds because it belongs to another job and not to the job that you were trained to do and are paid to do. With that being said, is it possible for professors to take stances in their writings? I mean, you know, a lot of professors are published, and even if they're not trying to get their values across in the classroom, if a student realizes, you know, what this professor's bias on a subject is, do you see that as shaping the way a student, you know, looks at that class or at that professor? Uh, I would think that the appropriate distinction would be between what the professor writes and in ways that do display uh, his views, opinions, and perhaps even values, and what happens in the classroom. In the classroom, I think you should leave your views and values uh, to the side and devote yourself exclusively to the unpacking uh, or analyzing of the material. And if you do that, you will communicate to your students that that is the job that they should be interested in. 
at the end of the courses that I teach, no one ever knows where I stand on the big issues that come up in the course of our readings. What I've been doing is explaining how those issues have developed, what kind of perspectives have been brought forward, which one of them seemed to have been persuasive and influential, how did that persuasiveness and influential uh, career occur, and so on. A student of mine could read, let's say, the columns that I write in the New York Times weekly and find out a lot about the way I think about a variety of matters. But I hope that that student would not find that the teaching of my course, whatever the course might be, had anything to do with the promotion of those values. I read online that you describe yourself as an anti-foundationalist. What foundationalist yeah. approach are you against? Well, foundationalism in general is the thesis that if we can only identify the core basic thing, the, the really real thing at the center, then we can organize our thoughts and our actions on the basis of that identification. Um, and that means to get outside of our own perspectives or in interpretive views. And I believe that that's an impossible project because it seems to me that the very instruments that we might use, instruments of language and other forms of communication, are already laden with presuppositions, with, with values, uh, and, and with perspectives. So it's not that I'm against foundationalism. Uh, as if it were an alternative that one might choose. I'm saying foundationalism is not a possibility, that you cannot get to the side of your own partial situated being and, and that the only agent in the world who possibly could is God. But none of us see things from a God's eye view. We all see things from the views that we occupy as historical, limited, temporal human beings, and the idea that we could get out of that to some foundation is, I think, uh, an illusion. One last question for you. Could you share with us and our listeners a couple of your favorite books or things you would want to lead other people to? Because I know personally it's hard to find good books these days. Well, unfortunately, most of the books that I find good are books that were written a long time ago, and they wouldn't always appeal uh, to younger readers, at least right off the bat. Although I think if younger readers were to give those books a chance, they would in time become entranced. So, for example, uh, one of my favorite novels is a novel written in 1915 by an author called Ford Maddox Ford called The Good Soldier, uh, which is about a complicated set of relationships between two couples and is written uh, in a marvelous and uh, deceptive fashion that I find absolutely fascinating. And another of my favorite books, and this used to be the most, uh, next to the Bible, the best-selling book in the Western world, um, is John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, uh, which was written in the 17th century. And in order to learn how to read, which is part of learning how to write, you have to learn both how to go slow, and to like going slow. All right, well, I hope you guys enjoyed the interview with Stanley Fish. You can find his book, How to Write a Sentence and How to Read One, on Amazon or at your local bookstore. But remember, you can purchase it through the link on our website, and it helps us out. Also, as usual, music has been brought to you by The Outdoors. We encourage you guys to check them out at theoutdoorsmusic.com. We post it all over our Facebook and Twitter account. We're huge followers. If you guys have a favorite author, a favorite book, send it to us or, or let us know, and we will try and contact them, and maybe we can get them on the show. And if you have questions, we'll pass those questions along to them. So go to the Contact Us on our website finally please go to itunes when you subscribe to the podcast give us a rating we actually hacked into the system so you're only allowed to leave us five stars so we appreciate that in advance don't forget to follow us on twitter smart people pod nah you can forget twitter's useless right (laughs) see you guys later peace
summer feet.